So let's summarize the material we covered in Unit 3. Unit 3 was on the box counting dimension. And so we began, well, by counting boxes. How many boxes of a certain side S are needed to cover a certain object? We called that N of S. We did a number of experiments and came up with this relationship. that The number of boxes needed to cover is some constant times 1 over S to the D. And then we saw, by thinking about circles and the like, that this really only holds as s gets really small. Uh, equivalently, one could write this as um, s to the minus d, using the fact that 1 over s is s to the minus 1. So one will often see it written this way um, in other books, but both of these are common. Also, um, some authors use r instead of s. Um, I like using s for side. And some also use epsilon. Epsilon is often used in mathematics for quantities that get really small. All three of these notations, S, R, and Epsilon, are very common. In any event, D in this equation is known as the box counting dimension. So after developing that, we considered log-log plots. So the idea there is we have this equation, and if we take its logarithm, we get this. And as I've said before, these two equations are exactly the same. It's the same equation, the same mathematical statement. They're just written in different ways. This is what happens after you take the log of that. And this is a useful or handy thing because it's the equation of a line, admittedly in disguise, but a line nevertheless. y equals mx plus b. So in this uh, equation, y is log ns. The slope is minus d. This is playing the role of x, and that's b intercept. So if we plot log of ns on the y-axis, log s on the x-axis, we would expect a straight line. So this is the result of doing that for a square. A number of different uh, box sizes. Boxes are getting smaller here. As boxes get smaller, you need more of them to cover the shape. So uh, this is very nice and simple, but uh, real life is not always this simple. So there's some complications. First, the linear equation does not hold for large box size s, as stated before. It's only um, that uh, we only see this equation as being true as s gets smaller and smaller. However, um, for small s, which is where mathematically we would, we would expect it to be truest, computationally and practically, that's the hardest to work with. We may run out of data, um, and or the shape itself may no longer be self-similar. Real fractals aren't self-similar forever. You can't zoom in forever. Also, this equation is not true for everything in the world. It's only true for processes or objects that are self-similar across scales. So um, a non-self-similar shape will not have a linear log-log um, box counting plot. Let me say a little bit more about some of these complications. So as I said, in natural fractals, scaling does not continue forever. So this is a really crude view of that. We might have a branch or a fern, and we zoom in, and we see more branches. And we say, hey, that's self-similar. And we could do that a few times. And then eventually, we zoom in on branches, and we stop seeing new branches. And we zoom in on that branch, and we don't see more branches. And we zoom in more, eventually it starts to look two-dimensional. So we would see um, scaling behavior for a while, but not forever. Um, at some point, the object switches over and turns into it maybe a two-dimensional object. And this is just another way of saying that um, in natural fractals and real fractals, um, we don't scale infinitely. So we can't let s get you know, all the way to zero, arbitrarily close to zero. All right, another thing that happens is um, as follows. So let's say we're representing um, a shape with a bunch of pixels. And these are pixels. I've drawn them as big dots here. But they're really math excuse me, mathematical points. They're exact x, y coordinates represented um, somehow. And so they don't actually take up any space. So this could be the case maybe if you have, you're sort of thinking of pixels uh, from a photograph. Or if you have data points, if you're uh, looking at a strange attractor from a dynamical system. So once the boxes are small enough, 
that you always have one pixel, one dot in every box. If you make the boxes smaller, that's not going to change this fact. So both of these uh, cases, n s would be 3, even though these boxes are half the size of that one. And again, the picture here is that these dots actually don't take up any space. So at a certain point, you um, don't get any larger n of s because you just have one point for every box, and that's the end of the story pretty much. Um, so this is another example of the problems that one encounters with a small s. So the upshot of all of, the, all of this is that in reality, in realistic systems, instead of seeing a beautifully linear log log plot, we often see something that looks like this. Yeah, it definitely looks linear um, over a region. Maybe we need to get rid of those points, maybe those. It's a little bit ambiguous exactly where the um, linear region is. The, and the linear region is the one we would use to fit the slope. So this poses um, data, um, data challenges, um, statistics challenges for estimating the slope d, because there's sort of a lot of arbitrariness here. And we'll face this issue um, in the next couple units as well, so I'm not going to say too much more about this now. OK, a few um, other comments about dimensions. There are a handful of different dimensions. Box counting and self-similarity we've talked about at length. There's also something much more formal and set theoretic known as the Hausdorff dimension, and there are lots of variants um, thereof. But all of these involve, in different ways, looking at how an object behaves when the scale of analysis is changed. So by scale of analysis, um, I sort of mean the, the size of the boxes. If we're thinking about big boxes, and then we think about smaller boxes and smaller boxes, how does the NS, the number of boxes needed, change? Um, and the Hausdorff dimension is a, is a variation on that idea. But the key thing is, is that in sort of application settings, my experience is that in most cases of interest and most of applied cases, um, these dimensions are going to give the same number if they can be calculated. So sometimes you know, this is very much more challenging to calculate. Sometimes we can't calculate this. But when we can, they all are telling us basically the same thing. And again, in most practical cases that I'm aware of, they're going to give the same number. Um, a little bit more about dimensions. Um, they ha these are well understood mathematical constructions and they have nice sensible properties. This is more the mathematics of dimensions and I'm not going to go into it in this course. The standard more mathematical reference for fractal geometry is the book by um, Ken Falconer. Um, so definitely written for mathematicians, maybe junior, senior level mathematicians, um, but the, the sort of standard text out there. One thing I'll mention, though, is that dimensions are topologically invariant. And that's a nice property. That means if I have a shape and I, and I stretch it a little bit, I, don't, I can't cut it or rip it. But if I have a shape and I just stretch it a little bit in this direction, compress a little bit in that direction, that doesn't change the dimension. And that makes sense because if I have a circle that's two-dimensional and I squash it into a, an oval, it's a different shape, but the dimension doesn't change. So, so smooth transformations don't change the dimension. So that's a nice mathematical property. And lastly, I introduce the idea of scaling, and we'll see this a lot throughout the rest of the course. So if this relationship is true, or equ equivalently if this relationship is true, Remember, these equations are the same. If, so if these are true over a wide range of s, and that's a pretty subjective specification, but if it's over a wide range of s, then one would say that the object exhibits scaling. There's some relationship that scales up and down. And what the dimension tells us then is that there's something that's staying the same as the scale is changed. So that's the idea of scaling. So this brings us to the end of Unit 3. Unit 3 was about the box counting dimension. And we ended up analyzing this equation, ns is c 1 over s to the d. And that's an example of a mathematical um, function known as a power law. In the next unit, we'll look at power laws more generally
and see how power laws and fractals are closely connected. That if um, a system is described by a power law, in a certain sense it's scale-free, just like a fractal is. So we'll learn about the mathematics behind that, and we'll start to um, explore some examples of power laws in mathematics and in the natural world. So we'll see you next week in Unit 4.